Hey again, it's Jesko from AcousticsInsider.com where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals but without all the voodoo. And in this video I want to answer another question on panel placement. And that is if you should include an air gap between the panel and the wall, right? So if you go online and you kind of research how you should mount your panels, you'll probably come across somebody saying, no, 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 you want to you want to put an air gap between the, the wall and the panel because that just makes it better or increases absorption somehow or something. And what I want to show you today in this video is if that actually makes a difference and whether you should do it ultimately, right? Because if you're just building a new studio or maybe you've got some panels up and you've read this and you've come across this kind of piece of information, you're wondering, is this something you should include? Or should you maybe even go around and update the kind of the, the mounting of all your panels to include an air gap? So let's get into it. And the quick answer is you definitely should if you have the space but there is a serious limit. And that's what I wanna show you right now. Let's start off with understanding what happens when you actually introduce an air gap behind the panel. So here I've got the absorber calculator, the porous absorber calculator, which I've looked at many times in other videos. Just as a reminder, this is basically a graph that shows us how well a certain depth of insulation material or porous material absorbs sound at different frequencies, right? So we've got our frequency axis here at the bottom going from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, the audible range. And then the vertical axis, the Y axis is basically a percentage. And so this line shows us how well each particular frequency absorbs sound for a certain depth. And right now we're looking at a simple absorber of around two inches, 50, uh, 50 millimeters, five centimeters deep, and just a nominal kind of density or, or weight that you would expect with most typical uh, insulation materials and kind of acoustics, more expensive acoustics foams that you can find. So let's have a look at what happens if I start placing this panel away from the wall, right? Again, it's a two inch panel. So right now it's sitting flush against the wall and we've got kind of our absorption peak at roughly two kilohertz and then it gently drops off towards the low end from there. So I'm gonna start adding a one inch air gap which is roughly 25 millimeters. And as we can see, the absorption kind of jumps or moves towards the low end, right? So our peak, our absorption peak kind of jumped down to maybe uh, 1300 hertz or something like that. So let's continue on. Let's increase that air gap from one inch to two inches. And again, we're increasing our low, low frequency absorption, our low end absorption of this particular um, construction of panel, this, this total panel depth um, of kind of two inches and two inches air gap has, has, has reduced down to around one kilohertz. That's kind of where the peak sits now. And we can continue on even further, right? So let's add a three inch air gap, same procedure, same thing happens. Let's increase that up to four inches, right? So that's the basic idea. The, the more depth you would add or the, the deeper the total depth of your panel gets, the more low frequency absorption you get from that same insulation material core. So that's the basic principle to understand. Yeah, so that's why it's advantageous to include an air gap. You basically get free low frequency absorption just by placing the panel away from the wall. But here's the crux of it. And you can already see that with this big dip that has started forming just over one kilohertz in this particular example. And I'm actually using this two inch absorber core example because it's particularly obvious, but the same applies to any other depth of material. As, as soon as you make the air gap much bigger than the actual core of materials deep, you'll start seeing a drop of absorption in the mids. And this gets more and more pronounced the larger that ratio is. So in this case, we've got an air gap that is twice as deep as the core of the material. And the reason why we start seeing this dip in the mid frequencies is because now we kind of have a situation where you have long wavelengths that still hit the material core 
at the peak of their velocity wave. So remember that porous absorbers, as I've covered before, don't absorb sound pressure, they absorb sound velocity, right? So that same velocity curve also is for pure, to pure tone a sine wave. And so at one quarter of the wavelength, you'll have a maximum of sound velocity in that wave. And if that, 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 that area of the sound wave sits inside your absorber, you'll get great absorption from that, uh, or that, ab that sound wave is well absorbed, is, is properly absorbed. But since the core is so narrow in, in relation to the air gap, you will actually find that higher wavelengths, uh, sorry, higher frequencies will be so short in relation that we've actually moved past the quarter wavelength point and maybe that, that slab of insulation material now sits at a half of the wavelength where there's no sound velocity in that sound wave. And so we get some low frequency absorption, yes, but the material isn't in the right spot to also absorb mid frequencies where the wavelengths are shorter. And that's the main thing to understand about an air gap, right? You get the benefit of added low frequency absorption, but if you make the air gap too large in relation to the material core, you'll start seeing a drop in absorption in the mid frequencies. So where does that leave you? Well, mainly to understand the, the thing to understand is you can use an air gap with pretty much any porous absorber, any sort of broadband standard insulation material absorber, but you don't really want to make the air gap any larger than the material core is deep. You always want to have a one-to-one -one ratio, um, a maximum one-to-one -one ratio, right? The air gap can obviously be smaller, um, but if you want to get the most out of that, that insulation material core, you can place it up to the same distance as the core is deep away from the wall and effectively double the depth of your absorber, basically. So let me just go back to a one-to-one -one ratio with this absorber and then compare that to filling the entire depth of your absorber structure with insulation material. So as you can see here, it's very similar, right? And that's kind of the benefit. You're, you're getting free low end absorption uh, just by spacing the panel away from the wall. It's not exactly the same, but it's very close. And it's definitely something uh, as, a, as a DIYer, if you're just building your studio, that you can benefit from massively because it basically halves the amount of insulation material you need to put in the room. And the same thing works for any other material depth, right? So with a three inch absorber, you can put it three inches off of the wall and effectively get the absorption of a six inch absorber on the wall. Or you can take a four inch material core and space it four inches from the wall and effectively get the same result as if the whole thing was eight inches deep. It kind of always works like that, yeah? You just don't want to stretch that air gap to core depth ratio too much because otherwise you get that dip in uh, that absorption dip in the mid frequencies. Just a word of caution though, and that is since I've been using examples of two inch and, and kind of four inch absorbers here, um, I still recommend that if you have the choice, if you're currently building new panels or you're buying panels, if you have the choice, still you should still go with a six inch absorber core, a six inch material core, because if you add a six inch air gap to that, you effectively get a 12 inch absorber depth. And that's where things really start becoming interesting in terms of treating a home studio, because at that point you're actually looking at something that can be considered a base trap and actually gives you proper or, or usable low end control. And I'm gonna link a video in the card now that explains why this is so important when you're treating your home studio. Okay, and one final thing, and that is that I've got a brand new guide for you, the Acoustics Insider Home Studio Treatment Framework, five steps to systematically treat your room and get it to translate. And I've linked it down in the description 
and I want you to download it because this is basically my framework that I go through, the roadmap, the steps, the five major steps that I go through when I treat a room, a home studio from start to finish. There are so many different techniques and opinions and approaches out there and that can make it really difficult when you're just starting out or you're kind of working, progressing through treating your room to understand what steps are the steps you actually need to take, what to focus on, what things matter and what don't, and in which order to go through these. When is it time to implement a certain approach? So that's why I've created this five-step framework for you, a roadmap for you to follow to treat your home studio. And in it, I show you exactly when to focus on what as you're building out your room so that you always get the best bang for your buck. So you always know that you're focusing, that you're working on the right thing at the right time. And so you can stop turning in circles and make sure any upgrades or changes you make to your studio actually move you forward in terms of mixed translation. Because it's so easy to do the wrong thing and worst case, it doesn't make any difference at all. Just because you didn't do this other really important thing first. So it obviously includes listener position and speaker placement and treatment with absorption and diffusion, but also when is the right time to think about integrating a subwoofer? When does it make sense to actually measure your room? How to address multiple speakers and speaker decoupling and also resonance absorbers and much, much more. So again, if you're building out your home studio, if you are working from a home studio as a professional audio engineer, then I want you to download my Acoustics Insider Home Studio Treatment Framework, five steps to systematically treat your home studio and get it to translate and get a broader picture of when to do what and all the things that you should focus on, that you should implement to make sure that you're getting everything out of your room and speakers. But right now, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. See you soon.